Hey, this is Jody with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. This week's video, we're doing 11 gauge cold rolled steel outside corner joints using MIG welding. 11 gauge is about an eighth of an inch thick, or three millimeters roughly. If you stick around to the end of the video, we'll do this little dice here. Because this video is geared toward welding students, and it covers five, the first of the five types of welding joints. Corner, lap edge, butt, T. This video is on the outside corner joint. Now the reason I chose this little dice project, I started looking for some little project that could that you could finish quickly, that welding students could see see through from start to finish and would teach something. Like in this case, if you don't drill the holes first, it'll teach you what happens when pressure builds up inside a small container while you're welding and blows out the end of the weld when you finally get it sealed up. I went ahead and drilled the holes first to avoid that in this. Okay, before we get to the dice, let's just talk about doing normal 2 inch by 8 inch joints like you would do in welding school. We're going to set up one and uh, we're going to tack a couple of them up first and we're going to set one of them up and do it vertical downhill and then we're going to lay one on the bench and do it flat. It really speeds things up if you have a piece of uh, scrap angle iron to hold them on with one hand like this or you can hold them with pony clamps either way but it speeds things up rather than just trying to hold them up like a TP on the and having them fall all over the place while you try to tack them. But I always like to make a few little dry runs in position make sure I'm in good position and then a downhill joint like this on this thickness metal which again is roughly an eighth inch there's many different techniques that work but a series of overlapping loops uh, just seems to be a go-to method for me and works on most anything you could go forward and back or just a zigzag downhill but uh, most anything will work just find something that works for you and roll with it for the flat, same kind of thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a few dry runs and figure out how I need to position my pinky prop and thumb and all that stuff so that I'm not in a, in a bind when I get to the end of the joint. I'd rather be in a little bit of a bind at the beginning and then be comfortable toward the end when I'm, I'm more fatigued. But again, this series of loops like this works on, on flat position. It's just a good method that gives you some little increment. It plays the light around and helps you helps you follow the seam. If you wear glasses like I do, it's, it, it helps me to play that uh, arc around a little bit rather than just go in a straight line because it, it, it gives me a little bit better perspective and helps me follow the weld joint. That's probably the reason I usually go to that series of overlapping loops on most everything I do. Now, when I was teaching welding, I always try to think up little projects like this to mix things up that utilize a bunch of different types of joints. This one utilizes them all, every single one of them. And even has some gaps in there because I uh, gapped those butt joints and so that makes, makes the overall uh, distance a little bit different. So it teaches uh, how to weld a gap too. And a downhill gap like this on an outside corner joint, unless it's huge, is not a problem with MIG welding. It's something to avoid. You always want, to want good fit-ups, but uh, it gives you something. That if you're teaching welding students, it definitely gives you some conversation points. To talk about the importance of good fit-ups and what to do when you got a gap and, and things like that. Well, that brings us to the little dice project here. And we're going to lay those out. It started off with a whole bunch of uh, two-inch squares. And then using these old worn out dial calipers, they turned into my dial scribers, but they're still pretty accurate, believe it or not, even though they've been beat up and dropped and you can barely read through the cracked glass. But I'm going to get a center line mark like that, and I'll flip it around the other way and get another one without changing anything. And that way, if I'm off a little bit, I'll have two lines almost next to each other, and I'll just split the difference from my center. I do a crosshair the other way, and then I'm going to come down to a half inch here, which is a quarter of the whole overall distance, and I'm going to make, make lines on either side. I'm going to wind up with a little grid like this. I'm going to pop nine holes, and this is just going to be a template, because no side of the dice has nine holes, but if you put nine holes in one piece, you'll have a template to mark one through six, the, the way that, that dice are laid out. So, you know, I'm just going to, you know, it's funny, I've got... There's two Bridgeport mills around the corner and drill presses and CNC mills and everything else, but I'm, I'm drilling this by hand because I figure that a lot of people will not have access to that stuff. And so, uh, you know, I'm just, we'll have to hand drill it. And that's, so that's what I did today. It, accuracy really doesn't matter here. I'm not after uh, 
You know, this is not going to fit on anything. It's just it's a it's a it's a dice. Had to look up on the net on how they were laid out, and if you were to fold one up, you know, make one out of paper. That's where I had that cross laid out there. That's what's going to help me remember how to get mine put together right. So spring pony clamps are a really big help on little small jobs like this, or a lot of other jobs too. They come in really handy. You can usually pick them up for about a buck each on sale. If you had 10 or 20 of them, it wouldn't be too much. So I'm going to get um, two halves laid out here, and then I'll put the end caps on those. I want to get just a small attack as I can get, which means I want to snip that MIG wire every time so that I get a good crisp start and uh, inevitably I forget occasionally to snip it, but try to keep make a habit of snipping that wire so that I get a, a, a smooth start as possible. You don't want any stutters on something like this. You want a really small crisp tack. And you can see I'm having to tweak it and squeeze it to get it to get the inside corners to fit up. That's pretty normal. And that's another reason why this is a good project for welding students because it it uh, incorporates a lot of that stuff. So once I get enough tax where I'm not worried about it walking and opening up with me while I'm welding it, we're about ready to fire up and weld this thing. I use 17 volts. I may have said this already, but I use about 17 volts, a little less than somewhere between probably 180 and 200 inches per minute of wire feed speed. I'm using 7525 argon CO2. And for uh, for 11 gauge, that was plenty good for this little project. I wouldn't want it too hot. I want it nice, just where I can you know melt in, and then everything flows good. Because this is strictly cosmetic stuff here. And that's always the case when you're doing a welding project. There's always something that's more important than others. Sometimes penetration is the most important thing. Other times ceiling and, and uh, just uh, appearance are the most important thing. And a little ornamental thing like this, it's strictly appearance. It ain't going to fall apart. All right, I hope to do a whole bunch of these using different techniques like overlaying with silicon bronze or uh, making one out of stainless and putting some heat tint on it and all that. And I hope some other people will post their videos uh, making some ones out of aluminum and things like that. I think it would be fun. Thanks for watching.